Hello, welcome to Math 214, Applied Linear Algebra. Um, if you're looking for information about how this course will operate, please read the syllabus on the Canvas page and on the course webpage. Um, what I want to do today is to talk about why do we think this course should exist? Um, why, what is linear algebra? Why is it worth studying? So algebraically, linear algebra is the study of linear equations. If you think back to high school algebra one, a linear equation is an equation like this one. Each variable appears just to a single power, not squared or cubed. No variables are multiplied by each other. We don't have x, y, um, lots of other things we don't have. All we have is our first variable times some constant plus our second variable times some constant plus our third variable equal to something. So this is a linear equation. That's the simplest kind of equation you could be thinking about. And geometrically, linear algebra studies flat linear objects, things like points and lines and planes. Um, that's a little bit of a simplification. There will be some curved shapes showing up eventually. But you should think about it as geometrically the study of the simplest geometric shapes and algebraically the study of the simplest equations. And while it may be good to come into a course and told that what you're learning is very simple, you might also wonder, is something that is this simple interesting? And can it be, can it be useful and can it be interesting enough to fill up a whole term of material? And the answer is absolutely yes. Linear algebra is one of those rare and wonderful areas of math where the demands of conceptual clarity and simplicity and the demands of usefulness can be satisfied at the same time. There's usually a tension between these things. But linear algebra is an area which is both incredibly clean and elegant and well-built and if you don't believe it after this term, please feel free to take courses in some other areas of math. And at the same time, incredibly useful and practical and shows up everywhere. And so what I wanna do for this first lecture before we start getting into all the nitty gritty is talk about why does this work? Why is it that something this simple can be useful? So I'm gonna give you four reasons. And my first reason is one that you've learned in calculus which is that everything is approximately linear. We can have some very complicated curvy function like this blue curvy line here. And if we zoom in on it and look at just what happens inside this little circle, then it looks much straighter. It's pretty close to this red line. If we zoom in one more time and blow up this small circle, then it's almost the same as the red line. And if we zoomed in one more time, you wouldn't be able to see the difference. So this complicated blue curve, zoomed in close up, looks a lot like this straight red line. Now, the main thing you learn in your first semester of calculus is how to calculate this red line, that is how to take a derivative, and hopefully also why to calculate this red line. When should you take a derivative and what should you do with it? But what I wanna focus on right now is not either of those things. What I wanna focus on right now is that our approximation is a line. And here we have its equation. The uh, equation says that f of x, the complicated curve, is approximately given by this expression over here. And what you should look at is that the variable on the right-hand side, the x, just appears linearly, not raised to a power or anything else. So this right-hand side here is the equation of a line. Now, this here is some blue curve. It doesn't mean anything, just some artist freehanded it. But uh, this is actually true of lots and lots of curves in the real world. So here is the response of some metal if you take a rod of it and stretch it out. So over here on the x-axis is how much it has been stretched. And over here on the y-axis is how much stress it pulls back with how much it resists being stretched out. And you can see, as you stretch it more and more, it pulls back 
got harder and harder until finally around here, you've permanently damaged the metal and it doesn't resist quite as much. And if you keep pulling even more over here, it snaps. So this is some pretty complicated curve and material scientists spend lots of time measuring them by hand or measuring them by machines. But the thing that I want you to focus on right now is that as long as we're in this domain over here where it's about you know, 2% stretch or less over here, the, the, the stress that you feel back is almost exactly given by this black tangent line. And for many, many purposes, your material is not stretching very much if it's built into some building or car or whatever. And so it's perfectly valid to approximate it by this linear stretching. And that's, and engineers get away with this all the time. They publish tables of the Young's modulus, which is the slope of this line for all these materials. And if you have you could have some huge complex bridge with thousands, tens of thousands, millions of components all pulling on each other. You could still approximate every one of those uh, stretching relationships as a linear relationship. And hence you can use linear algebra to think about it. Now, you can take a calculus course. You can take two terms of calculus without really knowing any linear algebra. Uh, here at Michigan, it's 115 and 116. But eventually, you do need to learn linear algebra. And why that happens is your first calculus course focuses on, linear fun focuses on functions of one variable. And so you approximate them by linear functions of one variable. And linear functions of one variable are very simple. There is not an extraordinary amount to know about them. Linear algebra is worth studying as its own subject when you have many functions of many variables. And that's why 214 is numbered right before 215, multivariable calculus. <clears throat> so, but eventually when you have thousands and tens of thousands of things interacting and you're approximating them all linearly, you wanna sit down and learn, okay, how does linear algebra work in the first place? So that's my reason one, linear methods are powerful because everything is approximately linear. My reason two, is that light, the thing we all see with, travels in straight lines. So here we see a painter painting a subject. He's got a wooden frame in front of him and in the middle of that wooden frame, there's a pane of glass and light comes in from the outside world and bounces off his subject and goes back to his eye and on its way there, the light breaks the pane of the glass and he takes his paintbrush or stylus, whatever it is, and makes a mark on the glass where the light passes through the glass pane. So the light traveling in the straight line and traveling in the next straight line is a linear geometric object and the pane of glass is a linear geometric object. And so you can think about this problem of where should I draw this man's ear as a problem of linear algebra. Um, artists usually learn this intuitively, not by computation, but uh, CGI programs learn it by computation. So what you see over here is Beauty and the Beast. Um, this one is Beauty and this one is the Beast. And they are dancing in a beautiful ballroom. And as they are dancing, the light is bouncing off them and bouncing into the lens of the virtual camera and breaking an imaginary pane in front of the virtual camera. And the software is drawing them exactly where the light breaks that pane. Uh, you could also see some fun geometric effects here. If you look at the floor of the ballroom, you'll see a rug and the rug has some parallel lines on it, but they don't look parallel to you. They look like they meet at some point out in the distance because the plane of the rug, a flat geometric two-dimensional object, 
is not parallel to the plane of the camera, and that means parallel lines on, on this rug appear to converge somewhere in the distance. And that is something you can think about through linear algebra. Okay, so my reason number two why linear algebra is useful is that it comes up whenever you want to draw things because light, which you use to see what you're drawing, moves in straight lines. Reason number three, because linear algebra is so simple, it can be scaled up to very large problems. So I talked before about the example of a bridge built out of millions of bolts and beams and cables all pulling on each other. You could also imagine a database of medical data, hundreds of statistics about millions of people. If you want to analyze huge problems like this and extract trends from them, you're not going to be able to deal with nonlinear methods. They're going to break down on having this much data and this many variables. Whereas linear algebra can handle absolutely huge computations. And this is why linear methods are so common in machine learning and data analysis and so forth. Uh, I've taught this course a couple of times now, and in my experience, reason three is the reason that is of most interest to, to most of my students. So I want to promise you, I'm organizing this course like a math course, which means we're going to start with basic things. We're going to start with how do you solve linear equations, and we're going to build in a sequential logical order. But we are getting here. here. The end of the course, we will be talking about how you use linear methods, beginnings of how you use linear methods, there are lots of good courses to keep going after this one, to, saw, to analyze very large problems and, and do this sort of data analysis. Uh, finally, reason four. Uh, I said everything is approximately linear. When you get to the most fundamental equations of nature, or the equations of electromagnetism, gravity, quantum mechanics, and the physics course, they are, to the best of our knowledge, exactly linear. So over here, you see Newton's second law, F equals ma, written out as mass times the second derivative of position is the sum of forces. Here you see one of Maxwell's laws relating the uh, space variation of the electric field to the time variation of the magnetic field. Here you see Schrodinger's law from quantum mechanics. And all of these equations are linear equations. When we combine the forces, we just add them up. We don't square them or multiply them. And there are a bunch of derivatives here, which might be a little bit confusing, but uh, you see that this E is not squared or cubed. I don't multiply one derivative of E by another. I just have one E here, which means this is a linear equation for the electric field. So my fourth reason is as you get to what it seems to be our most pure knowledge of nature, we find equations that are purely linear. Okay, so I've given you four reasons that linear algebra is useful. Everything is approximately linear. Light is really, really, really close to being exactly linear. Linear, linear methods solve really big problems, and the most fundamental equations of nature seem to be exactly linear. And what we're going to do now is shift to something much more prosaic, which is how do we solve linear equations? So pause your video, take a stretch break, brew another cup of tea, and then come back and watch the next video.